Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Chris Sharp from Homes England and I'll be your chair today as part of our winter learning program on progressing major brownfield opportunities. It is hosted as part of our local government capacity centre, which I'll say a little more about later on. Next slide, please. I just wanted to spend one minute on explaining the role of the local government capacity centre. So within Homes England, it develops, curates and designs well-structured, accessible offers for local government and their partners to increase capacity and skills, drive regeneration and housing delivery and create high quality homes and thriving places. So all really positive stuff and hopefully useful to everybody on the call today. Next slide, please. Okay, these sessions are held biannually by Homes England and we have a range of really useful resources that local governments and partners can access, such as fact sheets and toolkits covering a range of relevant topics, such as how new homes are planned to best practice guidance on achieving good design and placemaking opportunities. Links are provided in the presentation slides to those resources listed. Thank you. Next slide. So the session will run approximately to 3.25 p, uh, 3 p.m. today. It will consist of the main presentation hosted by our speakers from Mott McDonald's and Aspinall Verdi, followed by a short Q&A session and some final thoughts from myself and the presentation panel. Next slide. As, pre as previously stated, I'm Chris. I'm a town planner by professional background and have worked in local planning authorities, also within the private sector and within government agencies that spans 20 years. My experience covers a range of major housing, transport and infrastructure led regeneration, mainly across um, the UK central region. So uh, on that note, I will hand over to our presentation team. So I will hand over to Oliver to introduce himself and the rest of the team. OK, thank you, Chris. So um, I'm Oliver Steele. I'm the team leader of um, of a, a team within Mont McDonald called City Studio. Um, we're Mont McDonald's integrated um, uh, urban solutions team. We offer a range of services, including um, urban design, town planning and city economics uh, to support our clients in delivering um, sustainable um, urban development in projects such as you know major brownfield sites that we'll talk about today. Um, if I go through and introduce my other presenters today. I've got Hayley Miles, who is the director at Asper Verdi. Hayley has over 20 years of experience in the property sector and 12 years of that was in the public sector, eight years in the private sector, working predominantly in the Midlands, dealing with property, strategic land development and regeneration issues. Um, Andy Gibbons is next. Andy is the head of urban design within the Mott McDonald City Studio and Andy has worked on complex brownfield mass plan projects across the country and internationally. Uh, and then finally we've got uh, Lucy Bethel and Lucy is a technical director in Mott McDonald. She specialises in contaminated land um, and she's worked on a range of uh, brownfield development sites providing technical advice on risk assessment, radiation and associated services. So if we go to the next slide I'll just give a short overview. Uh, next slide please. A short overview of what we're going to talk about today. So in, in effect, what we want to do is, I suppose, offer a, a bluffer's guide to progressing uh, major brownfield urban regeneration schemes. And um, we're going to focus on the initial mobilisation stages of those schemes. And what we're going to try and do is to offer a, a toolkit or a checklist for those early stages, really to help address the common challenges that we've seen um, as we've worked on similar schemes. Um, and we focus predominantly on the public sector perspective, it is fair to say. Um, and that's really because we obviously understand the majority of the um, the people who will be uh, participating in the winter learning sessions today um, are going to be from a public sector. Um, background um, and, and very much we are focused on that early stage I want to stress that because um, you know there's obviously an awful lot you'll have to do for all these very long-term projects but really we want to focus on you know, what you need to get right um, at the beginning um, so this is not going to be a, a fully comprehensive aspect to every uh, every part of um, brownfield development throughout its process but it is going to be quite a wide-ranging discussion perhaps more so than some of the winter learning um, sessions and, it, and it's, so it's intentionally broad but obviously we can pick up detail in the Q&A um, afterwards. So why are we why are we giving this talk? Um, I think um, there's, there's, there's several reasons, but um, when we think about uh, brownfield regeneration, to us they, these are always complex, inherently multidisciplinary uh, projects. They are by definition the source of development where no one can know everything. Um, so that makes it that it really is important to have a consistent approach that you by which you you look at progressing these schemes to help you mean, not, mean that you don't fall into those common pitfalls that we'll touch on as we go through this. And I think part of that is also it's really generally affordable public private partnership these brownfield you know, urban regeneration schemes are generally um, at that intersection between um, public and uh, private interests and and for the public sector side you often um, 
are uh, working for the first time on, on major schemes. So it may be you only work on one or two of these in your career. So again, really, really important that you've got a consistent approach to how you, um, to how you uh, look at uh, uh, progressing them. Um, so if we move on to the next uh, slide, I'm going to give a little bit of scene setting before I, I hand over to colleagues to go through the checklist in more detail. Um, the next slide uh, summarises um, the def so this, this next slide summarises uh, a definition of uh, brownfield land. So um, I'm sorry if you don't mind going to the next slide. Uh, it, um, it, this is a definition given from the National Planning Policy Framework. So land which is or was occupied by a permanent structure. You know, obviously when you think about that definition, that that means that we're talking that that definition is, is substantially broader than perhaps what some people think of as 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 brownfield sites. You know, typically sites that need a lot of remediation and, and so forth. And um, but really today we do want to focus on perhaps a sort of a subset of this definition without focus on uh, those those urban sites. This, this definition clearly comes to rural sites as well. And really those set, those sites in a, in a existing urban setting and, and and the larger sites too you know typically 25 plus um, dwellings where we think there's kind of common issues that 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 tend to come across um, and on the next slide um, we, we have a little bit about you know what why should we care about brownfield land and I think you know so to many of us, this is self-evident that if we just go through this quickly, you know, why, why do we want to regenerate sites that are generally tricky, problematic, and expensive compared to, you know, um, compared to say greenfield sites? Um, I think first of these is you know, they are um, an important part of solving um, or, or addressing the housing demand challenges that we continue to have. Um, uh, housing supply challenge, I should say, we continue to have in this country. Um, there's there's quite a lot of good evidence that if you address brownfield um, redevelopment in urban settings, you tend to uh, transform the the future uh, prospects of those areas and the rate at which um, population growth occurs in in those uh, settings. Um, so so actually, if you regenerate an area in an existing setting, you have you have those kind of halo effects that benefit others. And that's a, there's a study by Holmes and economists that talk about that in the context of regenerating urban areas more broadly where they realised they, they demonstrated that there is a, this real halo effect on the wider impact area around a brownfield site when it is regenerated in an urban setting. And of course it's all about sustainable development. You know, brownfield regeneration is, is, is a type of development that ticks all of the boxes that, that um, we think of when we think of sustainable development. You know, economically by generating development and employment in, in, in often deprived area, areas, environmentally by remediating um, envir the environmental hazards of our industrial past and then socially by bringing new life into urban areas that you know perhaps sometimes are, are, are suffering from from a lack of it. Th these these are the types of development that are are core to our achieving our sustainable development goals. So if we go on to the uh, the next side, I'll, I'm going to talk about a little more by way of background. Firstly, on policy context. So the following slide has another definition from the uh, National Planning Policy Framework. This one is from um, December 2023. If you just don't mind moving on to the next slide, please. Um, uh, this this um, this is the latest definition of of government policy, uh, national policy that we should be pursuing in England towards the types of development we uh, we look to address. And of course, this is very you know pro brownfield, and of course, anyone who's worked in this area for a long time knows that there's there's very little new in this. Um, you know, the, a, 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 a bias towards or or a, um, a leaning towards brownfield first is something that goes way back towards uh way back to things such as the um the policy review towards an urban renaissance by by richard rogers's team in, in in the late 90s and then ppg very much had um in again in the late 90s had a had a brownfield first approach and had a 60 percent target for brownfield um development um the next slide has a little bit about homes england's position on brownfield development and this is homes england's new strategic plan um, and this has uh, you know, a very clear objective in it. If I quote, says um, we, Homes England, will support the creation of vibrant and successful places that people can be proud of, working with local leaders and other partners to deliver housing-led mixed-use regeneration for brownfield first approach. And I think, as a single sentence, that's a great summary of you know what what we're all trying to do here today, and and you know why we should be caring about brownfield development. As I said a couple of slides ago. And on the next slide, um, I just give a little bit of an overview of the wider policy and guidance that government has um, has prepared to support brownfield development. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot to talk about here, and I certainly couldn't cover it all, but I draw attention to things like the Environment, Environmental Protection Act 1990, which is you know, a statutory basis for local authorities for dealing with contaminated land in their areas, or Building for a Healthy Life, which is Homes England's led uh, design toolkit for neighbourhoods, streets, homes, and public spaces, and it covers placemaking for, for brownfield sites um, within it. So I think encourage um, you know, everyone on the call to look at those because they really are helpful guidance. So um, 
the following slide has you know an important bit of policy guidance that you know is now i suppose a well established part of a process but but was new back in 2017 which is the preparation by um, local planning authorities of a brownfield land register again all part of trying to encourage a brownfield first approach um, local authorities have to include sites within this brownfield land register which are you know large suitable available and achievable i think to give the um to give the definition and this is all about streamlining the process for bringing science forward for development on uh, brownfield land and, and an important part of um you know this, this this overall enabling piece at a at a planning authority and then, you know obviously a, ultimately a national level and um, the following slide shows a, a part of uh, the policy picture which i think will be of interest to many on the call and we can talk about this later in a bit more detail which is around the funding options that um, exist to support brownfield development of course a very high percentage of brownfield sites outside of you know the, the highest uh, value urban locations such as central london are going to need public funding um, to progress and there are you know a number of grant and aid funding sources available um, eligibility obviously varies some of them um, just for local authorities some of a wider uh, eligibility including development Developers. But if we just focus on uh, perhaps you know um, one of the largest of these that was was announced at the back end of last year, the Brownfield Infrastructure and Land Fund, which Homes England uh, administer, which is providing up, up to a billion through a continuous market engagement process with really a very wide um, applicability of, of applicability, sorry, of the eligible activities it can be used for, including land assembly, for example, and that we should certainly pick up in Q and A on if, if anyone has any questions on on how that fund operates, um, and it shouldn't be called either that you know this is not just about grant funding you know there are other types of uh, support including financing and tax reliefs available and one example of the latter would be land remediation relief which which offers 150 percent of corporation tax relief on um, on qualifying um, activities uh, that, that are related to brownfield remediation um so finally before i get into the checklist um we've just got a little bit setting out um you know i, I guess i guess the kind of baseline and the opportunity so these are land use change statistics uh these are from uh, the department for leveling up and they show you the percentage of development taking place on that definition of uh, previously developed land with previously previously developed uses um this is a decline from from you know, a few years ago, when it was as high as 80%, but it's but it's still you know broadly at 6%, albeit with you know significant variation um, around the country. Of course, this is you know, again not saying all development takes place on large urban regeneration sites. Um, it's it's really a much broader definition of that that includes infill and so forth. But it shows you what a significant percentage, um, you know, at least with the uh, with the, um, the legal definition brownfield development is. And then finally, what is the potential um, opportunity for future development on brownfield land? I think it's sometimes felt by um, by some commentators that uh, you know all the, all the low hanging fruit has been plucked. I don't think that is the case. This data is just taken from um, brownfield. Sorry, it's the next slide. So I'm a bit behind on slides. Um, so if you just go to the next slide, please. We oh, catch up. Thank you. Um, so this um, this this slide shows you uh, data from. Uh, that was compiled compiled by the campaign to protect rural England on uh, identified sites within those brownfield land registers that I, I touched on a moment ago, and this this is shown broadly that there's you know something like uh, four years housing supply just on identified brownfield land within those registered um, across um, across England, and and by definition I think those we'd accept those brownfield land registers probably under uh, estimate available supply. So um, you know I, I, I think we're all aware of large sites in the uh, geographies we work in, and I think we could all agree that you know there's still plenty of opportunity for further regeneration of those sites it will only of course be part of the picture of um, of addressing uh, our housing um, supply challenges but it's an important part of that picture so if that was a, a and if we just go to the next slide if that was a, a little bit of a, a whistle-stop tour of a policy context to set a framework for what we'll talk about today and um, this is uh, where i start to go into uh some of the um the ways that we think about unlocking those brownfield sites um, the, 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 I'm going to give an overview and I'll hand over, I say, to my more specialist colleagues to go into some of the detail. So on the next slide, um, uh, this, this slide sets out some of the challenges that you, know, you will typically face in these developments that, that we'll pick up as we go through this. Difficult locations, complex sites, land ownership challenges, and then you know, the, the inevitable viability and delivery uh, issues that, that you need to address. Um, so at the core of our approach to how you think about uh, addressing these challenges, is the idea of thinking fast, sorry, thinking uh, uh, slow and then acting fast. And that means um, understanding the context and the constraints and the challenges that you face from a start. And then in 
then uh, approaching the way you deal with them in a proportionate and agile way, you know, really not getting lost in the detail. And to us, that approach was summarised well by Peter Denton recently, who's, you know, I'm sure everyone's aware, is the chief executive of Homes England. Um, Mr. Denton said that the private sector should provide 80% of the capital for regeneration projects and Homes England could provide 20% or, or I guess the public sector could provide 20%, but he had it happy to be the first 20%. Um, and he said that, you know, this, this would help develop a master plan and infrastructure, enabling infrastructure. And then when we're de-risked and we're given confidence to private sector to come in. So it's showing the Homes England approach is consistent with what we're talking about today, a focus on understanding and de-risking sites. So the case can be made for um, for that initial public investment and then obviously that, you know, that, that much larger slice of subsequent prime investment that's needed to unlock um, complex development sites. Um, so a lot of what we're going to carry on to talk about today is that point about that de-risking and providing of confidence. So if we go to the next slide, this is uh, an overview of the pitfalls um, or you know, perhaps the, um, the the challenges we found uh, on unlocking these sites and the 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 the, uh, the, the problems that, you, that uh, proponents can get into. And again, as I said, this is focused, and it's not exclusively focused, but it's focused on um, on issues we found working with public sector partners involved in these complex. Um, projects again as we know that you know this is a predominantly public sector audience on the wonder wind learning series so if we go through these in turn um, i think the first two can be um can be discussed together a design first approach or ignoring technical and commercial constraints i think what we're saying here is um we, re we really care about how an urban regeneration project interfaces with what's already there. Um, the agent of change principle requires compatibility, compatibility with existing uses, and that needs to be addressed. Um, and, and, but sometimes we, we we can allow our vision and you know our, our, our desire to have an understandable desire to have great design um, to to be. Uh, part of what we focus on uh, without reference to those constraints. And of course, nobody's going to benefit when you've got unrealized or undeliverable visions, uh, however powerful they are. So that, that constraints point is so, is so fundamental. I mean, the, the next point is about forgetting about stakeholders. And obviously, these, this is an important part of the context as well. And Andy will talk about this in uh, in more detail. I mean, what, what is really interesting is actually when you look at the data, and this is, I think, data again that Homes England has compiled, um, the, Public sector, sorry, you'll find that uh, stakeholders in existing urban areas are generally you know, very positive about um, urban regeneration compared to, you know, typically, you know, urban extensions or, or other types of development. Um, but obviously, they're only positive. I mean, this is self-evident, but only positive when they've when development thinks about maintaining the character of a local area and takes account of the local heritage and um, does something that's in line with what's already there. So, working with stakeholders is just so fundamental to progressing these um, these schemes. Um, fourthly, I've put a point about assuming control over all the levers. And what I mean by that is, you know, the public sector's role in progressing schemes uh, at scale on brownfield development varies. You know, sometimes uh, the public sector can be major landowners, sometimes they're more um, reliant on policy and, and planning driven um, levers. I think it's really important that um, whatever roles you have, or whatever levers you control, you acknowledge those up front, because we typically find that where that doesn't happen, sometimes there can be a belief that you, you control all of the process in the public sector. And actually compared to a lot of the, the types of uh, policy and, and capital investments that the public sector makes, that's just going to be always be the less the case in the types of um, project, which is or types of program like an urban regeneration scheme, where, as I say, typically 80% of the capital is coming from the private sector. And linked to that, of course, is this point about not always understanding up front the routes to market. And this is something Hayley will talk about in more detail. But obviously, it is just so fundamental um, to, uh, without understanding this, you really do not have a scheme. And of course, early thinking about this is going to save headaches later. You know, thinking through that, that, that those structure between how the public and private relationships um, are, are going to work rather than whisting away those kind of commercial constraints. So if we move on to the next slide, um, this is an overview which we use to, uh, to Within, our, within Mark McDonald um, as one of the tools that we've developed to ensure that we, we consider all the uh, processes of that early stage of um, of uh, developing um, you know, large regeneration schemes. And as the arrow shows, we're going to focus really today on that analysis and due diligence section. So on the next slide, um, we've got the, sorry, if you could show the next slide, we've got the Brownfield land initial checklist that we've developed that, that builds upon the previous um, yeah, sort of over, overview structure. Um, 
so my colleagues are going to go for each of these elements in turn, but if I just to reiterate why this due diligence phase matters, I mean, really, this is about addressing those pitfalls I described a moment ago. You know, it's understanding the framework within which you operate before we move to visioning and optioneering. It's about scrutiny of project fundamentals. You know, what are the key things you need to go right that we need to do and in what order to make uh, your place um, based development a success you know due diligence done right will answer all of that and of course it clarifies that role for the public sector and, and perhaps going back to my other point it ensures that you can think slow but being well positioned to hand to act fast and with that i'll hand over to Haley, who's going to uh, start to talk about some of the detail of the checklist thanks thanks oliver yeah so the first element that we're going to be discussing is land ownership land ownership can have a significant impact on the development of brownfield sites particularly where an area of experience in viability issues. The land purchase can sometimes be one of the largest proportions of costs associated with a development. So ensuring that the land ownership is understood and considered very early in the process and also designed into the master plan stages can be critical for success of a project. Understanding the land values also associated with the scheme early on in the process can ensure that there's no additional costs or ransom situations. And where a site has significant infrastructure requirements, equity of the net development across land ownership is crucial to ensure that development can progress. And this should be considered very, very early on in your development timeline. It's, it is critical that the value of development to landowners is in excess of the existing use value. So having an understanding of what that existing use value is very early on can really help to drive forward any development. Landowners are also a, a critical stakeholder in the overall development and they should be consulted early on in the process. This might need to be subject to negotiations, but it can ensure that steps can be taken to mitigate that wider risk and viability issues that comes later down the line. We're increasingly seeing the public sector lead forward with development, but where a site has public sector land ownership and the area has been identified as a need of regeneration, if the land is used effectively, this can result in long term economic benefits for the area. But with public sector land ownership, there are issues that need to be considered. And these issues can include subsidy control, as well as acquisition and disposal powers governed by the Local Government Act. And I recommend that you get these considered very early on in the process and also keep them monitored throughout. Sometimes a site has no identified owner at all, and this can have a real delay on the development. If you've undertaken a land ownership exercise at the very beginning, you can highlight this early on and the design, to keep, to, the design team can then start to consider whether um, they can deter reliability on this area. However, if it is an, uh, an area that's unable to be avoided, so you need to carry out development on the on the area that is unidentified in land ownership, then you do need to consider instructing legal teams very early on in the outset. There may be CPO requirements or statutory declarations which need to be considered, and this can be quite a lengthy process. So just to sum up in terms of land ownership, what does this mean for a, a scheme? Land ownership constraints are solvable, but it takes time, effort and money, and you must uh, you can't wish them away. Land ownership issues that will impact on the delivery strategy. Crucially, land ownership of a proposed development should be considered at the very outset of development alongside the delivery strategy. Critical success factors include undertaking an exercise of understanding the ownership, considering the title matters affecting land. So if there are restrictive covenants or overages, they need to be identified very early on. Preparing your stakeholder engagement plan and ensuring that landowners are part of that. Drafting your delivery strategy so you can understand the reliance on your land ownership and engaging with your design team very early on so that they also have a clear understanding of ownership and they're able to recognise any critical issues across the scheme. I'm going to hand over to Lucy now, who's going to talk about contaminated land and geotechnical conditions. Thank you very much, Hayley. Lovely. Thank you. So contaminated land and geotechnical issues can be one of the most acute risks in terms of uncertainties and, and abnormals when we look at brownfield redevelopment. Contaminated land constraints can relate to previous contaminative site uses both on site or on adjacent sites from obviously a wide range of industries including power stations, chemical works, railway land, so on. It can be present due to poor disposal practices, spills or accidents, historical use of contaminated construction materials and many more. 
Contamination issues can also be due to waste disposal on authorised or unauthorised landfills, burying of waste on sites, um, fly tipping, this kind of thing. And there can also be risks from gases associated with landfill sites or coal mining infrastructure. All these sources can adversely impact human health and the environment, and contaminants can migrate within the environment. So unfortunately, they don't obey site boundaries, hence the need to look at adjacent sites as well as the existing one. Geotechnical constraints can include things like very dense or very soft natural geologies, existing foundations or structures, um, sinkholes or high groundwater tables. Other constraints can be existing utilities um, and the requirement for utility diversion, which obviously have cost and program implications. And when combined with contaminated land, it, they can become very complex. With utilities, it's important to interface with the utility providers early to understand what they think is there, uh, recognising that asset registers aren't comprehensive or may be outdated. And you need to consider the, the need for surveys in later phases. It's also of vital importance with respect to utilities to take appropriate precautions and mitigation during any works that break ground, such as ground investigation or remediation. And because all these are in-ground constraints, they may not be immediately obvious and certainly not easy to quantify. It's also worth noting that some sites may have been remediated in the past, but it may have been inadequately done by current standards or not remediated to the standard required for housing. So they impact development in a number of ways. Um, so they can represent risks of undevelopable or unfinanceable areas. And although any contamination can be managed with enough time and funding, in reality, it might make areas of the site or, or the whole site unviable without further support. Um, contaminants can also impact green infrastructure and drainage strategies. And obviously, where remedia investigation or remediation is required, increase those development timescales. But there's lots of useful guidance out there, including the HCA guidance and more technical guidance from the Environment Agency, British Standards and, and lots of industry working groups. So what does this mean for the scheme? One of the key mitigation strategies which we always recommend with respect to contaminated land is a proportionate early stage risk assessment by a competent specialist. That's to say you don't have to go in and start peppering the site with boreholes or start pumping out oily groundwater or whatever it might be. It's to really adopt a staged approach starting with a desktop site assessment, including a site walkover to look at the historical land uses, the geology and environmental setting. And all of the data supporting this is readily available. And once interpreted by a specialist is hugely informative. So this assessment can obviously then be used to develop high level mitigation strategies and remediation costs to inform risk cost exercises. There may be an early stage requirement for site investigations to better characterize the site um, and the, the in-ground constraints, but this depends on the site and the level, to, level of certainty required at each stage. So this information is then used to um, inform upfront funding options, interactions with other disciplines such as drainage, ecology and so on, um, and the program, the construction phasing and, and all the other aspects that go into this kind of development. So the key takeaway is really think about this early and talk to competent specialists. So thank you. I'll now hand over to Andy. Thanks very much, Lucy. Uh, next, uh, no, we're all right. We're on the right slide. Uh, so, flood risk and drainage can have a major impact on net developable area. This includes risk of coastal river uh, and surface water flooding. So, early checking of flood risk and flood zone data online is very much uh, recommended. It's also worth bearing in mind that brownfield sites are often located where existing watercourses are already polluted by urban drainage and where flooding could be exacerbated. Uh, by nearby urban development. Uh, also, um, check local authority sustainable drainage policy and guidance so you understand some of the local context. So what does this mean for any particular scheme? Well, the risk of uh, abnormals here can impede development, adding potentially significant costs and delays, eroding scheme viability. So upfront proportionate flood risk uh, assessment is essential for major sites, uh, which also gives you an opportunity to factor in uh, climate change. There are major benefits from early engagement with environment agency and local flood authorities and districts and borough councils, but also with other stakeholders uh, such as water companies uh, and highway authorities. Next slide, please. We move on to the next slide, please.
Um, green infrastructure plays a significant role in environmental resilience, uh, community well-being, and, and of course, contributes significantly to local character. So identifying, incorporating, and protecting existing ecological assets is a key consideration. Biodiversity net gain uh, becoming a statutory requirement in England, so early consideration of potential impacts are essential. It's also uh, important to uh, remember that uh, site schemes may also have to incorporate other aspects, including outdoor recreation uh, and place-based provision. So what does this mean for any, any particular scheme? Well, ecology and green infrastructure might at one level be uh, considered a lower risk to development compared to some of the other aspects we're discussing. But it's also important to recognise that brownfield sites can often have considerable biodiversity value. So it's essential to understand this in obtaining statutory consents and securing community buy-in. Once again, this emphasises the need for early consideration of biodiversity net gain and it's essential here um, to consider the impacts of surveys and assessment requirements which may have cost and program implications and biodiversity net gain requirements could significantly impact on total developable area so very much advised uh, to look at this very early on next slide please in terms of built form and heritage, uh, brownfield sites generally sit uh, in an existing urban context. This context uh, can be used to help sh shape design responses, in including consideration of building uh, typologies and the scale of development. Undesignated structures and landforms have value to the to site character uh, and contribute to local identity. There are specific considerations, of course, around designated heritage assets in and around sites, including setting considerations. So listed buildings, scheduled age mon monuments, registered historic parks and gardens and wider conservation area designations need early identification. But also don't overlook non-designated heritage assets identified in local and neighbourhood plans, perhaps in conservation area appraisals or indeed uh, on a local heritage list. So what can this mean for any particular scheme? Well, taking account of built form and heritage is essential to secure both statutory consents. Uh, also provides an opportunity to uh, encourage uh, and garner community buy-in for any particular project. And these aspects can be positive drivers of scheme, character and identity. Early stage archaeological desktop studies can highlight potential archaeological significance and reveal the historic character and identity of, of the site and surroundings, which can be used to inform design from a very early stage. But these aspects can drive up costs and impact on viability in some areas. So once again, uh, early sight of these issues uh, um, provides um, value. Next slide, please. In terms of site access, um, the availability of, of site access from an existing highway network would be a key consideration, including uh, a view about the uh, capacity of that network and whether there was connectivity provided by active travel and uh, public transport. And of course, in some locations in the country, uh, some of those public transport networks may have capacity issues, uh, for example, in London and South East or in other uh, major urban centres. And in different parts of the country, um, there may also be pressure from the market to deliver homes with car parking. Um, this can have implications for site layout uh, and may, uh, in fact, uh, also affect the uh, achievable density and number of units. So it's advisable to check local plan policy uh, early on. What does this mean for uh, any particular scheme? Well, external funding may be required for major transport um, pro projects to um, bring about uh, improvements to the network that are, uh, are triggered by uh, the development you're considering. Um, but these could affect um, program delivery uh, and uh, have an impact on, on cost of the scheme overall. The location and nature of rail and metro style stations and public transport interchanges may reveal significant opportunities for connectivity and also to drive up 
uh, density. These environments can present significant complexities, however, uh, and may well require um, specialist expertise to unlock development potential. It's uh, as well also to um, uh, factor in that in some cases, not in all, but in some cases, transport and planning authorities uh, are not always as joined up uh, as, as they could be, uh, further reinforcing the benefits of early engagement. However, uh, a lack of scheme information at an early project stage can sometimes limit uh, the level of engagement that you can achieve. Next slide, please. Planning po policy uh, at a, a national level, obviously uh, an important consideration, but the cascade down to uh, the local plan level, very important to understand uh, development management policies and any site allocations that relate to the site that you're dealing with. Identifying the nature and location of environmental de designations, also key. Don't overlook supplementary planning documents, which might be topical or area-based, but also neighbourhood plans, um, which will um, feature uh, the site perhaps, which may include support for redevelopment of vacant and uh, dilapidated sites, particularly where these sites have been seen as problematic by the community uh, for long periods of, uh, of time. Also, don't overlook design guidance and, and codes where they exist, which can also help to form a design response to, to any particular site. Also important to consider Section 106 planning uh, obligations, particularly around affordable housing provision and community infrastructure levy. And it's well worthwhile also considering the planning history of the site, including previous and extant consents, which can also provide uh, useful background information uh, and insights uh, from a very early stage. So what does this mean for any uh, particular scheme? Well, local authority-led schemes will typically have uh, planning policy uh, front and centre from inception, but plans and guidance do obviously get out of date. Contemporary development typologies and densities may not have been considered when uh, uh, particular plans or guidance was being drafted. And the local authority uh, may be considering preparation of policy and guidance, and this might impact your site. It may also present um, a significant opportunity to align policy and guidance development with bringing forward uh, proposals for uh, any particular site. Next slide, please. Clearly, uh, stakeholders and community have a significant influence in planning decisions. And of course, stakeholders include a wide range of interested parties, including statutory consultees, non-statutory bodies, uh, and of course, uh, numerous um, community groups. So uh, the impact on any particular scheme, well, there, there may be an inevitability about degree of nimbyism and local oppositional concern uh, in, in looking at uh, a, a particular site. Uh, however, tackling brownfield sites that have been vacant and dilapidated for some time can also gain local support. Uh, it's really important to understand who the scheme stakeholders are um, uh, as a first step and uh, also to emphasise early engagement with stakeholders and bring them along with you. Uh, and, and of course, this presents um, significant opportunities to highlight key challenges and opportunities from an, from an early stage. So designing your engagement and consultation programme activities from an early stage is, is well worthwhile. And I think there is it, it's well documented and, and, and rehearsed, of course, but um, meaningful and well-planned community involvement can really improve the quality of development, responding to local aspirations and concerns and context through uh, uh, an embedded uh, process. And at this point, I'll hand back to Hayley. Thanks, Andy. If we can just take go to the next slide, that great. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to just be talking about viability and as um and i suppose this kind of brings sums up all of the all of the elements that we've talked about uh previously um and i think i'll just start with kind of ensuring that developments are viable is essential for their delivery uh, viability is at the heart of the planning process at the moment um but it does need to be given due regard uh at the very early stages of site promotion the cost of building materials 
as is rising at a particularly alarming rate. We we are seeing us uh, uh, then stagnate uh, at the moment, um, but um, we're also seeing an increased pressure in terms of of housing policy. Um, policy expectations are increasing, so the viability challenge has never been so acute. Coupled with a deepening housing crisis, the need to get any consideration of viability right is greater than ever. Many of the areas we've discussed today result in a cost for the development. Uh, they can't be avoided and they are significant development costs, particularly when you're considering remediation, flood risk, geotechnical issues, etc. that my colleagues have talked about. Land prices, again, um, are a significant cost to your development and they must reflect the state of the land being developed. We're seeing increasingly that aspirational land values that don't actually, particularly in a brownfield uh, situation, do not reflect the state of the land. Planning policy and the MPPF is going some way to ensure that there is um, a pushback on land values and also equity across the stakeholders. Um, but land value is one area that we're not fully getting to grips with. And overpaying for a brownfield site can stop the development in its tracks from the outset. Um, developers are pushing back against policy expectations as well um, to create viable sites. And um, we're seeing affordable housing delivery suffer because of this. If due diligence is taken very early on and preferably prior to land being acquired, and therefore land values are agreed based on realistic costs and proposals, incorporate the results of these studies, then the likeliness of the proposed scheme being delivered is increased. But realistic expectations of what a site can be de can deliver need to be managed in line with findings from all of the above areas that we've discussed today. At the very outset, the cost of preparing your brownfield site for development is going to have a significant impact on what can be delivered and whether or not the private sector will have an interest in bringing a site forward. If you carry out your due diligence and that results in an unviable development site, um, then you're also looking at gaps in viability that need to be funded. Unviable brownfield sites are left derelict and then they create further regeneration issues which exasperate viability issues for the wider area. So we just end up in a, uh, some areas are ending up in, in a regeneration loophole, so to speak. <laughs> Managing uh, landowners' expectations and carrying out a market review at the very outset can help to steer the direction of the development and ensure a delivery strategy can be achieved. But also addressing the needs and the wants of the stakeholders is critical. Um, and, and, I, and I suppose from my perspective as a viability consultant, I very much say what is a need and what is a want? What can we get? Uh, what do we not actually need on this site? Sometimes you'll find that there's additional costs brought in, um, which can completely halt a scheme. Um, but actually, it's a want and not a need. Stakeholders, including Homes England, local authorities, developers and landowners that need to start working together to ensure that we're able to get through the housing crisis. Uh, and having worked in the um, in the development scenario, no one stakeholder is actually profiting from the situation that we're currently in. Um, we're hearing that all strategic objectives from the stakeholders are the same. The delivery of affordable housing is crucial. Local plan is a key element of tackling part of this, and I'm ensuring that um, Andy touched upon this, but ensuring that your local plan is uh, is updated and um, takes into consideration a lot of these issues can really help from the outset of development. We need to start removing the unnecessary bar barriers and then also being realistic with the objectives for a development, especially when we're considering development of brownfield sites. It's crucial that remediation does not become an exercise for viability uh, about whether a scheme can offer affordable homes or not. So getting the expectations of landowners, developers, the local authority at the very early stages of development and, un and understanding whether or not a scheme is, vi is viable is critical for its delivery. <coughs> If a credible market-led route cannot be found, then consideration really needs to be given to funding. Unfortunately, there is no magic cure for viability issues. It's a risk to development and it can create issues across the lifespan of that development. I recommend 
updating uh, your assumptions, your end values, your gross development values, and reviewing costs along the process to ensure that delivery isn't halted at any point due to viability issues. And then uh, throughout the process, it's just making sure that stakeholders step back and consider what the main objective of their development was to ensure that if additional funding is needed, the objectives are in line with the objectives of that fund. Brownfield funding generally helps to secure the commitment to affordable housing provision for site, but is best placed for sites where an economic assessment has been carried out and those wider qualitative outputs can be measured over a long period to create confidence in the wider area. I'm going to hand back now to Oliver to start to discuss some approaches to address these issues. OK, thank you, um, Hayley, and thank you to my other colleagues um, for going through some of the um, some of the sort of technical and commercial detail that we look at. Um, so with the last few minutes before we go on to case studies, um, we're going to build upon that initial checklist that we follow and that we advise others to follow um, in working towards de-risking and locking brownfield regeneration schemes. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, we this this shows you some of the areas that we will get into um, in this section. Um, so to date, what we've done is we've tried to look at the areas that typically create risk and hence impact on the financeability and deliverability of schemes. And of course, there are other areas that you could go into from a similar perspective. You know, there are hot topic issues in areas such as nutrient neutrality or water availability or biodiversity in a game, that there's always new new areas that you could consider. But but what we want to do is to conclude by going into those subsequent phases that are shown by um, the, the the phases shown within this arrow here um, of a typical brown filtration scheme. I'll do that in an overview just to to make sure we're, we're offering you um i guess a, a comprehensive picture of how you progress these schemes so if we go to the next slide um on this next slide uh we show you some of the the the, the, the next steps you'll do once you've gone through that initial uh de-risking uh phase um in some ways it can feel like uh you've done the hard bits up front and you're now moving on to some of the more fun bits you know, visioning optioneering maybe market engagement but also the uh the the, the fact for battery is that these are the facing reality bits you know for example it's about when stakeholder views that andy talks about will start to coalesce you know, often people are um, supportive in concept but once you have something specific to say specific uses and phases and uh and, and other typologies then you're going to hide you're going to crystallize um opposition to your scheme that is inevitable and that's why this this phase the stakeholder phase um in this phase becomes increasingly important um, and it's, it's really also at this stage that realities um, around uh, policy areas that we wish to influence can can uh, come run aground so think about things like affordable housing or social and community infrastructure we can often have you know ambitious goals for those uh, understandable goals of course given the policy priorities of our area and um, but actually of course again once you go into that that market uh, engagement phase and you speak to potential development partners you can find that and, and you start to go through consent processes some of that you know inevitably will, may may fall away um, the, the, i suppose the primary message we want to leave from this section is that this is above all a very long journey so really what do we need to think about well we think what we need to think about above all is how we keep our, all of our stakeholders not just community but you know, members investors and, and 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 many other actors how do we keep them on board over the types of a project like this that typically will will require a very very long time to uh, to realize and, and we've always got to have in mind we've got to have some way of having in a, a at the heart of it, um, having in mind what we're trying to do here. Um, so um, we think this process as we go through here is, 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 is critical to that. So on the next slide, I touch on developing the vision. Um, and if we're starting with this, these points about visioning and optioneering, and of course, there's lots of potential elements to this, but I think you know, the points I would make is this needs to be an initiative process, you know, a process that's developed for engagement with those stakeholders that I touched on a moment ago. I and mean, it's then iterated with development partners, as, as Hay talked about, and put the viability um, front and centre, whilst at the same time taking account of the wider built environment and the heritage of the site that you're um, you're, de you're developing. And, and also that is in line with the wider strategy of, of its broader urban area. Because if you don't do those things, if you don't put together all of those factors, many of which we 
we we touched on in the previous section you're not going to have um, uh, a vision that's going to stand up for the long term and um, and, and we think similar to that is thinking of that vision as a framework for development and not a blueprint. It's it's a vision for all stakeholders to coalesce around, um, but it's not one that has to be delivered in the, in the minutest of detail to meet all of its objectives. On the next slide, I touch a bit more on um, some of the further technical assessment that you'll typically do as you go through this process um, on a site. And of course, lots of technical ass assessment will be uh, required as you go into optioneering and mass prime praise and look towards things such as um, you know, market engagement and, and, and consenting. Um, now, all of these studies can be uh, can be important. And typically, as you go through this phase, you'll start to move from some of those desk based studies that we touched on in the previous phase to something that may involve um, you know, more detailed and hence more more um, more intensive and more expensive site investigation in many cases. But again, what I want to say here, and I suppose it may seem strange for uh, you know, a technical consultant to say this, but what I want to say here is that proportionality is key. Um, you really need to think about putting first things first and not just trying to tick off every study that, you know, that may seem required um, as you go into this. And, and you know, really, part of this is just not being overly guided by, by all of your advisors or by stakeholders who will always want you to do another study. Think about what's really required to go to, given the constraints you face and given that vision you're trying to achieve. And my final slide on this is just to say a little bit more if we go to the next slide around funding and delivery <clears throat> and you know we will understand the I guess the framework for viability from a due diligence phase but as you go through this mass plan phase as, as I mentioned um, you really need to be thinking about that constant iteration as you go into the detail around those options you're looking uh, to develop. And you also need to think about the commercial model that's going to uh, be appropriate for the site and um, and, and again, you know, that uh, that will vary significantly depending on the numbers and the types of landowners and the risk appetite. And assuming, as is many, as is often the case in these large um, large urban regeneration schemes, some public sector ownership role, and um, many um, yeah, the public sector uh, in question will need to think about when it when it wants to realise any gains and how far it wishes to take you know any, any development risk. Um, and part of that, of course, will also be how far the public sector wishes to think about funding. You know, think about those front end funding issues, given all those funds and, and other uh, other de risking sources we talked about up front that can help to enable the overall development vision. And I think part of this will also be from the public sector side. You want to think about the specific powers that you have that you know, the private sector does not have, and how those can be bought. Sometimes these often complex sites, you know, updating supplementary planning guidance, supporting land assembly, and again, as I say, you know, helping secure public funding from external um, government bodies. Whilst at the same time thinking about how you execute those powers, whether it's for existing governance arrangements, you know, as a, as a, as a local planning authority or equivalent, or whether it's putting in place some, some form of you know new statutory or quasi statutory body, um, such as a development corporation. I think I think the point is that you know, these all I'm trying to leave you with here is that thinking about these funding and delivery aspects is just as uh, fundamental at this stage to um, thinking about you know vision design and optioneering and also you know te technical de-risking without a credible commercial solution in the market the scheme is not going to proceed now there is, there is there's lots more we could say on all of this but if we what we're going to do now is hand over some I'm going to hand over back to colleagues who'll talk through three case studies where we try to bring all of this together and try and bring some of the, um, the lessons that we've trying to convey today to life through projects that Momodon and Asimov Verdi have, made, have worked on I'll hand over first to Lucy. Thank, thank you very much. If we could have the next slide, please. Um, so this first case study is, a, is a, a brief one which illustrates the value of the early stage engagement of the contaminated land conditions, which I spoke about earlier. Um, the project was an urban extension to a city in southeast England. It's a mixed brownfield greenfield site and the brownfield has a history of um, light industrial uses. So before they started, the client was actually aware of some historical in-ground contamination. So as part of that really early master planning phase, we undertook some early stage risk assessments. The client, the client was very keen on engagement with the technical team to support the master plan. And, and this actually resulted in placing lower sensitivity land uses on the potentially contaminated areas. The client went ahead and commissioned um, voluntary remediation. And as this was developed early on, um, the construction program was managed to allow additional time for the remediation works and also the fairly complex planning consents, which we had for this site, which involved two local authorities and the environment agency. Um, we ensured early and very transparent engagement with the local, local planning authorities and the EA, and that had huge benefits in terms of securing those timely planning approvals. So the remediation itself um, was developed with a specialist remediation contractor to optimise um, the efficacy and the methodology so that the busy industrial area where the contamination was located 
could remain in use and the radiation didn't affect um, the existing underground utilities. Um, these photos here show the very exciting remediation work in progress. I mean, it really was edge of the seat stuff. Um, so the remediation work in this case was costly due to the complexity of the ground conditions, the commingle contamination and the space and the time constraints. So in this case, due to the high land value of this site, um, public funding was not sought uh, to support the development. But we recognise that for many other sites, um, without that funding, development of this part of the site um, could be unviable. And it would also represent an ongoing environmental liability for the relevant parties if it wasn't addressed as it had become apparent. So for this one, we achieved planning sign off in 2023, which was a great result. Um, and I'm certain that the, really the early engagement with the technical teams and the local planning authority and the environment agency were key to successful management of the contaminated land constraints for this development. So thank you. I will hand on to Andy now. Thanks, Lucy. Next slide, please. Great. So um, Froome Gateway is an inner urban area in Bristol of approximately 15 hectares. Uh, the local authority has identified potential for over 1,000 new homes and employment uses across multiple sites in public and private sector ownership. The local authority had identified the need for a comprehensive and coordinated approach to secure the best place outcomes and address the need for supporting and enabling infrastructure um, and importantly set within a, a long term vision. Parts of the area fall within flood zone two and three, so early identification of flood mitigation strategy, including river restoration measures on the River Froome engaging with the environment agency uh, was was a key aspect the process involved considerable iterative testing of land use mix to best align with site constraints and infrastructure delivery including funding and phasing a regeneration framework has now been prepared uh, it sets out a comprehensive vision for transformational land use change uh, with the aim of increasing investor confidence and identifying supporting infrastructure requirements. And the spatial concept plan from, from the framework is shown on this slide. The framework has been achieved with considerable stakeholder and uh, community engagement over a, a two year period, uh, representing a uh, significant investment. The project is uh, an example of an area based framework providing the context in which individual uh, sites can come forward in a coordinated way and uh, I think also highlights the key role of the local authority in the process. We'll move on to the next uh, case study and I'll hand back to Hayley. Thanks Andy. Yeah. Um uh, this case study is uh, in Leeds, in Mabgate, Leeds, and I wanted to highlight it just because it, it's uh, it's quite far down the timeline um, and has the potential to come forward. Uh, Mabgate is an area that's been identified for regeneration for quite a significant time. Um, it's been a struggling area. Uh, it's it's very deprived, and and the council have been working um, at, and local stakeholders to make sure that there's a development framework in place. Um, that framework has been in place for a number of years. Um, there's also a regeneration framework as well. But this is a site that's um, coming forward actually from the private sector, um, which uh, is, is, is a great example of, that, uh, of, of all of the stakeholders trying to work together to, to bring forward a scheme. The site itself um, has quite a few market failures um, with rental affordability being one of the biggest issues but it's also a historic industrial site in a city um, has ab abnormal ground issues there's a demolition that needs to be undertaken there's geotechnical issues because of a previous foundry um, it also sits within a flood risk um, and there's also uh, environmental issues with contamination hotspots across across the whole of the site. The proposal looks at delivering um, about 240 homes, 238, I think, to be exact. Um, there's also ancillary commercial space with that, amenity space, retail, leisure space, etc. And then a number of uh, uh, car parking spaces as well. 
Um, <clears throat> but I, I wanted to highlight this one particularly because this is actually a site that's been submitted for uh, the Brownfield uh, Housing Fund. Um, and in doing so, it therefore has to meet a number of, of requirements to be able to get that um, Brownfield funding. Um, so it's coming forward with 20% affordable housing. Um, there's also another uh, uh, quite a few qualitative outputs from the scheme. You know, there's a hope that there'll be 500 jobs. Um, there's creation of, of new public realm, all of these things um, that can then be um, uh, monitored throughout because it's going through the Brownfield Fund. Um, the, the developers are looking for reduction in their operational carbon through it as well. Um, and then there's the uh, cycle storage, et cetera. So trying to move away from cars as the dependent kind of mode of transport. Um, and, and then ultimately, they're actually only asking for about 8% of the costs from the Brownfield funds. It really kind of highlights that um, that Homes England kind of Peter Denton quote that Oliver talked to earlier, if the public sector are, are able to kind of push forward that 20%. And it's not always 20%. You know, this is an 8% need to bring forward a scheme. Um, then we can work together. And 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 so, you know, the land, the, the developer as well, they are getting um, or they're reducing their profit target. So down from the usual 20%, they're looking for a lower profit target. Um, so this is a real example of all of those stakeholders having to come together to try and deliver a scheme. I'm going to hand back to Andy now, who will sum up today's presentation. Thanks very much, Hayley. Uh If we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, yes, I'd just like to uh, take this opportunity just to bring together some of the aspects that, uh, that we've highlighted. Um, so firstly, early assessment and due diligence really need to emphasise the, the value of this. Um, and of course, that needs to extend beyond the technical uh, per se into considerations about land uh, and viability and, and delivery. Uh, also very important to understand the vision and, it, and its drivers. Uh, what What is uh, the particular development place vision? What are the other um, aspects or objectives that um, need to be met? And, and in doing so, time spent building consensus is obviously well spent. So engagement with stakeholders and the wider community throughout out the process, uh, very important. Uh, it's also, um, I think we've also highlighted um, or, or the, the need for a proportionate staged and agile approach um, rather than front ending, uh, for example, uh, uh, an overly focused design um, uh, perspective early on. Um, perhaps that needs to be uh, uh, balanced with a, a greater understanding of technical constraints uh, and uh, land and viability issues, recognizing that um, place quality can also be built into uh, later stages of the process. Thinking about external funding sources from an early stage does pay dividends. Um, and uh, that also needs to be combined with an understanding of being prepared for a long journey. And, and I suppose linked to that also is the need to uh, plan uh, and uh, have an understanding of the resources that you will need to take forward any particular project. So thank you very much. Uh, and that is the conclusion of our presentation. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thanks, Oliver. And thanks for everybody uh, presenting on their topics today. That's really appreciated. Um, so hopefully some of that is really useful. There's a lot to get through there. And and, and again, I'll emphasize it was an, intended for an overview. So, you know, we could spend an awful lot of time um, drilling down on the detail, but unfortunately time doesn't allow that for today's session. But what I would say is there's lots of other learning topics that sort of cross over on this topic. Um, so, um, so some things that have been asked in the chat, I, th I, th I think, you know, there is availability and resource there to maybe um, 
get onto the summer learning program events which will be held later this year but yeah for the Q&A then so I have been looking at some of the questions I, I don't think we can try to get through all of them but I have tried to look at some of the more popular ones or also some of the ones that have been themed so I'll start by um, shouting some out to um, the presenters and um, if I can answer some I'll, tr I'll try um, and, and if not hopefully some of this can help me out um, so yes yeah, so um, so there was a question quite early in about the actual bill funding. Uh, I'll just put a link to that in the chat. Um, and, 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 and unfortunately, we, we don't have an expert or specialist on the, on, on the presenting panel today that covers our bill section. We, we do have a, a markets place and partners team who unfortunately were, I, I did invite but couldn't attend today due to other commitments. But I, I suppose what, what this was about was the, the is 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 the bill funding program um, quite difficult? Is it aimed at large scale? Is the minimum grant asks? What, what I would say is it's you know one of many funding streams. It's not the only funding stream there. It, it is quite large scale. It's you know the the you know it's intended there, and 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 these funding regimes do flex through different types of um you know uh, political regimes and 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 so forth so but what what i can say is that there is um um that there is two routes to the funding so there is a strategic route and that is probably aimed at the large scale um but that's combining not just um just local authorities and partners but that's um mixing in with uh, uh the combined authority also uh, and then there is also um a continuous market engagement basis as well so um that's looking at you know where uh, where sites have continuously stalled um, and could be s smaller scales, but again, I'm not I'm not an expert on 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 that. But hopefully, that's sort of covered some of it. But do access um, the link because that's that's it's all on the government's website, and um, there is more information on there in terms of funding options um, and eligibility. So um, the next question was about. Um, is there any advice to brief members on brownfield development and it imp and how this impacts on affordable housing? So I think I think what I get gauge from this question was that maybe members um, who are residing over planning committee uh, applications are often are often looking for obviously high affordable levels of or, or affordable compliant levels of affordable housing I should say uh, and maybe brownfield development has all of these complexities we, we've talked about such as viability and and remediation so um as can I open that up to the panel has anybody got some good advice that we can feed back to uh, local authority uh, partners and and its members are you happy Hayley, for me to jump yeah. in Ollie please yeah. do Hayley, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you yeah, a, a room full of councillors. I'd love that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this comes from, I suppose, my experience of working on local plans for local authorities. Um, and <clears throat> when it comes to your affordable housing, getting your local plan policies correct in the first instance is the best place for the councillors to start. You should be ensuring that you have uh, carried out viability and delivery assessment against your local plan. Lots of people, especially, I mean, we're seeing uh, it, it's, unprecedented in terms of how local plan making is at the moment we've not had to challenge it to this extent with costs as high as they are um, and the solution to that can be a gradient approach it doesn't have to necessarily you don't have to have a sweeping approach of affordable housing across your district your borough etc you can start to look at those low value areas and encourage development in those low areas by tweaking your policy requirements um, it's better to have 10% affordable housing than no affordable housing in a, in a low value area. And I think it's been realistic as well from a biodiversity net gain point of view, from a net zero carbon perspective, as actually how much can your area support that within development? We are challenging a number of local authorities who are trying to increase biodiversity net gain percentages above government recommendations. And the real challenge is if you if you haven't tested whether that's going to work, you're going to miss out on your affordable housing unit because of it. So you need to be really careful in terms of how you uh, put forward your plan policies in the first place. Secondly, um, if you've already done your plan and therefore you're getting financial viability assessments submitted through planning to reduce the affordable housing requirements, my one recommendation is to make sure that land values are not the reason that your affordable housing is being pushed down. 
there is uh, the MPPF created benchmark land value. Now, benchmark land value is a tool that enables you to make sure that land values are not that you that you're not pay, overpaying for land. So, developers are overpaying for land. They sh that shouldn't affect the affordable housing requirements within your area. You can test that against benchmark land value and push your consultants, whoever are doing those financial viability assessments, to make sure that benchmark land value is in line with the MPPF and not aspirational land values, which we see a lot of the time, just because lots of development needs to happen and therefore landowners are getting a little bit greedy. Um, so there are tools that have come forward for the MPPF, but there's a little bit of a lack of understanding around how to use them to make sure that they don't impact on your affordable housing policies. I don't know if that's answered the question and whether any of the rest of my team want to add in on that. No, I, th I think that's great. Hayley, I'd, I'd like to get through as many as possible. And and, and apologies if we don't specifically get to um, the, the, the finer detail of the question. We, we, we are trying to sort of assume here what's been written in the chat. It's always it's always a little bit better face to face. Um, but yeah, there's um, there's a there's another there was another question really there's some environmental led um topics which I've, I've tried to combine so um obviously we've got the bng aspect on that i know that andy touched on that as being um you know this could impact viability also i think with bng i think we we could talk forever on this there's there's been lots of sessions and seminars being promoted recently on bng um but also we've got uh, questions around nutrient neutrality as well uh, as having an impact um not, not just on brownfield i would i would say other, other sites as well uh, and that's a hot topic with some sites currently stalling on 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 those sort of large scale holding objections so um so yeah, is there is there any thoughts about the sort of I, I wouldn't say recent because they're not, but the, the, there's legislation change there to make a difference, but it's it, it's going to impact it. Is it another impact on viability on brownfield land and sites and, and making it more difficult or asking for more more funding and more resource? So I, I might touch a little bit on one or two of those, perhaps focus on nutrient neutrality because Andy did touch on on biodiversity net gain, Chris. Uh, I mean, I don't think these are inherently Brownfield um, issues. I think they're, they're development issues, I, I, I should say. Um, and of course, um, case of nutrient neutrality, they're not uniform um, throughout uh, the country. I think the one thing I'd say from, from working a bit on nutrient neutrality issues um, for various public sector bodies recently is that, you know, whilst there's a really important role for private sector promoters to think about how they can assess, how can they, they can address, how they can mitigate any nutrient impacts on their schemes, and they, they should and must do that. I think the the public sector, you know, um, local authorities working with um, Natural England, the Environment Agency, and other stakeholders really need to take quite a proactive role in this in our, in our experience. And actually, there's a lot you can do as a local authority affected by these issues um, that can help to address um, these, these challenges, I guess, at a strategic level across the catchment area within uh, your area. Um, you know, there's, there's technical solutions, but there's more kind of delivery type solutions where you can think about perhaps taking a proactive role which which potential developers then um buy into an asset you're offering or you can help to sort of enable things like third party um platforms that, that can achieve similar um outcomes so th there's quite a lot of technical work being done in this space um out there i think you know my one takeaway is that developer role important but given where we're at and given the you know the likelihood this is going to carry on now for for um for, for a period um the um each local authority that's affected so that needs to start or if it's not doing already um really needs to be started to being proactive on how it, it seeks to address those those challenges across you know any, any development that's within that catchment i don't get colleagues may wish to add more but that's those are probably my two cents on it brilliant thanks ollie thanks um just a couple more um i, I want to get what uh, through the, there was a question surrounding about um you know what advice or help is there out there for um sort of um, maybe local authorities of a, of a smaller nature with limited resource or, or, bu or budget, really. We've talked about um, the, the level of due diligence needed on some of these sites and the resource. Um, so how, how can we offer some assistant, assistance there? Obviously, what I would say from Homes England is, you know, for us, we're, we're there to help. We're, we're the government's housing enabler. And, you know, I would promote um, all to our resources um, that, that we've got there to help and, and funding avenues. Uh, although there's a lot to get through, I think it's worthwhile to sort of swat up and see how we can how we can assist. And, and, and we have specialists within the agency 
who work specific, specifically with local authorities to come and talk and, and, and build relationships with, um, with, with planning authorities and uh, the econom economic regeneration areas of, the, of councils as well. Um, but yeah, is there, is there any more specific advice we could, we could give from the specialists on, on that sort of heavy resource um, issue? So Hayley, I think you were going to, you put your hand up and then I'll perhaps come in after that. Yeah, and, and I don't want to um, teach grandma how to suck eggs, but I've worked in local authority and I get it that sometimes it's really overwhelming with the amount of decisions that you've got to make and trying to move anything forward when there's so many differing priorities. I think just a couple of things that I just wanted to highlight is uh, it, it surprises me sometimes how local authorities aren't aware of the procurement options open to them. Homes England, for example, have the property framework. There's a number of frameworks and consultants such as us, we're, you know, we offer cheaper rates through those frameworks. So th generally making use of those frameworks means that you've got a procurement route to go and get this sort of information carried out um speak with your i mean i'm doing myself a disservice and my, all the guys here are just going to turn around and start rolling their eyes at me but there's no you don't have to commission the whole project Im initially what you can do is commission advice and that is much cheaper so uh commission some advice get get a delivery strategy in place start to look at your options don't commit to necessarily moving things forward and as far as you can keep keep the expectations low keep i'm sorry to say this to any councillors and like but keep it a little bit away from your councillors until you've got the kind of go ahead because what you don't want is them making a big fuss of it and it's suddenly becoming a priority for political reasons as opposed to for the regeneration benefits that might come from that site so it's i i appreciate it's a really difficult job but there's just a few little kind of tips to get forward also talk to each other you've got loads of cpds and etc cetera, etc cetera. one council will have been through it at some point or another yeah. um and it's definitely worth that communication within your local government um conversations um to share your experiences and to use that expertise that's already in-house yeah oliver i'll let it come back to you no, no, I, I, not much more to add. I was going to say your point that um, sometimes people think you've got to go on these very big, all-encompassing commissions to organisations like, you know, Mots or Aspera Verde, and you really don't. You know, we actually like doing those early stage advisory pieces. Um, you typically tend to get the sort of senior practitioners like on the call today for something really focused, even, even in workshops, what have you. It's amazing what you can do out of that. And then, then you'll work out what you need. And often, you, that's a, yeah, it's a key message. I feel like we're probably working against ourselves today, but the key message <laughs> again is, you know, you don't feel you've got to do all that technical work and commit to upfront because often actually the private sector is a better place to do that. But it's that early advisory piece will help you to identify uh, what it is you need and, and who's best to do it. Excellent. Yeah. And, gr and great point about, yeah, that communication within your organisation as well, because um, sometimes it's it's often that we can work in silos because of pressures um, uh, and, and the business as usual aspect of, of the role. But um, we sometimes don't, re you know, really find out what other other skills and expertise people do have. And when we do, it's great and we collaborate. So, yeah, promote all of that. Um, uh, just one final question, uh, a really good one I really liked. How do you measure success in a brownfield regeneration scheme? So developers quite often say that high density scheme will be a catalyst for regeneration of the area. So is that that that's not own, the only measure of success? It can't be. What what other factors um, can can be uh, can be combined to get that um, the level of su success reported? So I can give my views. I don't know, Andy. You're you're the the placemaking yeah, yeah, yeah. Do, you want, yeah. do you want to give your views on that and perhaps others like the, the case study as well in. in Leeds was great as well I thought that, 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 that yeah I'm, uh, yeah I think we're going to come at this from a number of different ways but um certainly in terms of place outcomes so um the success of a scheme in terms of how it's um delivering um place quality um and that could come in a number of different ways in terms of um, not only the density of development but the provision of um, uh, public amenities, whether the coherence and nature of the public realm, uh, green and open spaces, diversity of housing types and tenures, um, it, it goes on. So how um, a scheme has met the expectations and delivered not only on policy, but also particularly where there's supplementary guidance, which may have um, set out a vision for the area. So you can see whether or not um, the, um, the vision and the objectives for change have have been met Hayley 
Yeah, just to add to that, I suppose it's um, those objectives are really crucial for getting that short term uh, praise in, oh, actually, this brownfield site was a success. And if you've met many of your objectives, fantastic. The sad thing about brownfield is you don't see the results for about 20 years. (laughs) So (laughs) it's having that long term view that really helps to understand the success of a brownfield site, because the, the little I say little, but, you know, the 500 homes that you're delivering next year, um, in 20 years' time, that can have a catalytic effect across a whole uh, town centre or community, et cetera. And it's bearing that in mind. It's it's keeping that as, as the long-term focus as well and, and trying to make sure that there is a master plan in place that, that can guide you on that process. Thanks, Alan. The only thing I was going to add um, was just to say, you know, ask people. Um, and by people, I mean before, during and after in particular, talk to the local community um, in and around the scheme um, and, and the people who are, you know, visit and work in, work in the area. There's, there's just no substitute for that. You can't really put metrics around a lot of this stuff in, in my view. Um, but, but we all know places where you can find great case studies and of people who felt their lives are so much immeasurably better by addressing uh, a brownfield crater in their midst. Um, and we also know places where a lot's been spent, but actually people feel things are worse than they were before. So, you know, ask people. That's the heart of it. It's, but it is a long term process. It's a really, really long term process. Oh, that might perfectly segue into the remaining slides. Thank you, uh, Oliver. Thanks for that. We'll close the questions down now uh, just because of time. And I know I'm conscious we're, we're, we're a minute over, but um, the next few minutes, if people could just stay on that, would be really appreciated um, for, from us. So if we can just move to um, the slides, please. OK, so these are the take home messages, really. Um, they're, they're largely a repeat of what Oliver said. Um, so but I've, I've just uh, I've put down some notes um, during the session. Uh, I think we've all sort of agreed and reiterated the early upfront due diligence that's needed. But I think um, a takeaway message from me is that that needs to be proportionate to the size and scale of the site. So get to know your sites really well. Um, and um, it can be a long, difficult process, and it can be resource heavy. I, I, I think we probably haven't mentioned that it can be it can be rewarding. It is sustainable. Um, it, you know, I, th- I think it, it's it, 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 these schemes can be exemplar exemplar and used as really good case studies in 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 future sessions and to promote CPD nationally. So I think I think that's it. Um, and then also, uh, last one, I think we did touch on it a little bit, but the community, the community buy-in as well, I think is really important. Uh, I think the most successful schemes is uh, is where, you know, change can be promoted. And we do see some of that in our Brainfield land, maybe more urban city centre, um, city centre um, areas. And I think when when you've got that supportive change and, and, and it's, it's, it's a good way in then to, you know, promote ownership with the local community, get some stewardship in, promote and obtain some social value out of that scheme. And I think those are the most rewarding schemes to be involved in. So those are my summing up, all really positive. Um, and and what I would say is we've got some um, key organisations um, links to the right and some wider learning uh, aspects there. So and i think that's the last slide so yeah that's us done so thank you i'd just like to thank uh, everybody for attending today's session we uh, we really encouraged by the numbers um so i hope you've taken something away that's been useful uh, and you can add tcpd if the rtpi come knocking and um yeah thank you to our presentation panel as well so thanks to andy lucy Oliver and Hayley for um, for for giving up their time to uh, to present and organise um, the the main uh, presentation today, and also thank you to my colleagues in the local government capacity centre. They're working behind the scenes and making sure everything runs really smoothly, and that these word clouds and polls uh, appear and disappear in time. So thanks for that. Um, so yeah, ha- have a great rest of your week. So thank you all. <laughs>